Welcome to week 12, and this week we turn to the Pax Romana, what's called the Pax Romana, called Roman Peace, Latin phrase that means Roman Peace. It's considered one of the great achievements of the Romans, uh, a period of more than 200 years of relative peace and prosperity for the Roman world that began during the rule of Augustus. The Roman army was kept out of politics. There was a largely peaceful transition of political power. Foreign invasions were prevented. And this created an environment that allowed for trade and education, the continued formation of a united Mediterranean culture that would form the foundation of Western civilization. First, however, we turn our attention back to Augustus. Augustus faced a problem of succession. There was no official office of emperor. Remember, Augustus had simply amalgamated the office of tribune, the office of high priest, and the office of consul to himself. He also had no sons. Uh, and so he adopted a successor. And this would be a practice that would be followed by many emperors after him. And so the dynasty that Augustus uh, is the first emperor from this dynasty is called the Julio-Claudian dynasty. But none of these emperors are actually related to Augustus uh, by blood. These emperors consolidated the practice of concentrating the power of the consul and the power of the tribune in the hands of one man. Um, and they also developed a centralized imperial bureaucracy. So a class of workers who worked for them, uh, as, and then they would work in collaboration uh, with the Senate. In the end, Augustus' successor was his stepson Tiberius. He was made to divorce his beloved wife, Hypsania, the daughter of Agrippa, who was one of Augustus' most faithful generals, to marry Julia, the daughter of Augustus who had proposition to him while she was still married. Uh, and so uh, this is the thing about the Julio-Claudians, the family side of things is quite messy. And so Julia lives a life of orgies and adulteries. Um, she's exiled, she comes to, she comes to hate uh, her father. Um, and Tiberius is forced to marry her in order to legitimate him as Augustus' stepson and heir. Augustus dies in 14, Tiberius offers to return all the powers that Augustus had received back to the Senate. And then the Senate in return grants them back to him uh, for life. And so this is really interesting from the perspective of uh, government, the evolution of government here. Everyone knows that Tiberius is Augustus' successor, but this still maintains the idea that he is the successor uh, of uh, Augustus through the power of the Senate. This power ultimately comes from the Senate. It maintains the understanding that the Republic still survives. Tiberius was an ex effective administrator. He was an excellent general. Uh, he was not a great politician. He was a terrible public speaker. Um, and because he didn't really like exercising uh, the power of government that much, he liked military campaigns, but he didn't like governing. Uh, he worked well with the Senate. He actually increased the power of the Senate because he would rather uh, pay where uh, they were doing this kind of work. Um, and so, again, this relationship, this uh, what we call the period of the Principate, where we have an emperor in all but name who's working in collaboration uh, with the Senate. Uh, this continues. Um, Tiberius has the same challenges of finding a successor that Augustus did. He had a very popular nephew in general called Germanicus, who was assumed would inherit from him. Um, he died uh, very young. Um, rumors that he was poisoned uh, by his relative named Piso. Piso definitely committed suicide after a visit from one of Tiberius's uh, right-hand men who we think kind of pressured him, uh, said, you know, either you commit suicide or we're coming for you. And so this guy uh, is now positioning himself to succeed uh, Tiberius. Um, and uh, he manages to outlast the, uh, the biological relatives um, of Tiberius. He plots to seize the throne only to be found out uh, by Tiberius and executed. And so when Tiberius dies in 37, uh, after a reign of 23 years, there's no obvious successor. Um, all his biological relatives have, uh, who are anywhere closely related to him have died. This guy, Sejanus, 
had been positioning himself to take the throne but was executed uh and so in the end uh the youngest son of one of the branches of this julio claudian family uh the great grandson of augustus was uh, accepted as tiberius's heir and uh took the name of caligula move on to the next slide now the third or fourth slide of the powerpoint caligula showed early promise he recalled all those who had been exiled by tiberius um, in this sort of dysfunction that happened towards the ends of Tiberius's reign. Uh, but then he became ill and basically he went insane. He called himself Jupiter, he nominated his horse for consul, he executed a popular foreign king who was an ally of the Romans because he was jealous of his attractive purple cloak and this led to a four-year-long revolt in North Africa. Um, he antagonized the army and uh, was assassinated in the year 41. This is the first but not the last time that the Roman army would remove an unwanted emperor. So the army is the third part of this dynamic of power in ancient Rome here. You have the emperor, you have the senate, and you have the army. And you need to have two of them on your side. And the problem is that Caligula gets to a point where neither the army nor the senate likes him, and then it's all over. So either you're gonna have an alliance between the emperor and the army, that's what happened with Julius Caesar and with Octavian Augustus. You're going to have an alliance between the Senate and the Emperor, keeps the army in check, as you did with Tiberius, or you're going to have an alliance between the army and the Senate, as we see here, which is going to remove the Emperor. So the army made Caligula's uncle Claudius uh, the new Emperor. Uh, and Claudius is a fascinating figure. He had a limp. He had a stammer, he was considered an embarrassment to his family and was kept in the background. And the Senate felt compelled to give him these imperial powers. Note it's still coming from the Senate uh, because the army wanted him. Uh, nevertheless, he was, despite all this, a popular and able administrator. Uh, he worked with the Senate in an effective way. He issued and passed many laws increasingly see how difficult it is to actually pass a law. These laws included measures uh, that were to designed to protect the rights of slaves. So slaves who were abandoned were set free. Slaves who, if slaves were killed, their owners were charged uh, with murder. So this is certainly a significant improvement in the rights of slaves that's made possible under the rule of the emperor, not under the rule of the republic. And Claudius also completed a number of construction projects built aqueducts to improve the infrastructure of Rome, he improved port facilities to increase uh, and uh, simplify the supply chain, all the grain from Egypt that had to come into Rome. Uh, he demonstrated his military prowess by further expanding the Roman Empire. So he made uh, client states in Africa and Asia and the Middle East, including Judea, uh, into client into provinces, part of the empire. He also conquered uh, the territory of uh, Britain. Like the whole of the Julio-Claudian dynasty, he had family problems, which of course leads to succession problems. In 48, his wife was executed for her involvement in a conspiracy. Uh, his new wife was his niece and she persuaded the guard uh, to make her son Nero the emperor when Claudius died in the year 54. And so, of course, there's suspicions that Claudius this was poisoned. I move on to the next slide, and Nero is, of course, a famous or infamous emperor. Uh, he becomes emperor at the age of 16. He's the last of the Julio-Claudian dynasty. He had no experience in government or in uh, military experience, interested in singing and acting and poetry and chariot racing. Um, and so he would spend his time as emperor traveling the empire and setting up chariot racing competitions that he invariably won. Even one time he fell off his chariot in the middle of the race, but was still declared the winner. But he was laying on entertainment and that's a way that people, rulers, have often tried to deflect uh, from their own failures uh, is by laying on mass entertainment, lay on a big sporting event and try and make people forget about uh, what's going on politically. Despite Nero's overall incompetence, Roman military campaigns were still successful in Britain, in Armenia uh, and in Judea. 
Um, Nero, however, becomes increasingly unstable uh, and increasingly paranoid and increasingly tyrannical. He poisons his rival, Claudius' son. He tried to kill his mother. We remember she was a little manipulative. She had manipulated her son into becoming emperor. Um, and so she's out in a boat and uh, Nero sabotaged it. So the boat will collapse. And so the boat collapses. Right. And uh, so then you think she's going to drown. And Agrippina was pretty resourceful. She swam ashore, and there she was beaten to death. Um, so uh, Nero also murdered his wife at the instigation of his mistress. Um, and he also persecuted the emerging Christian population in Rome, um, making the Christians a scapegoat for a fire that had started in the city we think more likely was started by Nero himself or under his orders that enabled him to build a huge palace uh, where a huge part of the city had been burned out. Uh, and so Nero becomes increasingly unstable, his rule becomes increasingly chaotic, and in the end the Senate grew exasperated with him and forced him to commit suicide. This brings us to the end of the Julio-Claudians and we'll talk about the Flavian dynasty in the next video.